So, so I mean, you're you're a basically third generation. I'm a net raiser. Right? You uh, and so so how much money did you raise in oh. back back for O Photo? Let's see. O Photo was 19.99. We raised a lot of money. Um, we we did two trunk we did you know series A and a series B but in a very short period of time we raised sixty million dollars and that was less. it was in ninety nine during the boom between ninety nine and two thousand let's say and you, and you and you sold the company to Kodak to Kodak in two thousand one two thousand one and was that was that a success for you was it was was that it was, a great it was event? fun yeah it was a good thing <clears throat> so could you have raised sixty million dollars now for the same idea oh god. Is this the confession part of it? Um, you know what's interesting, and I think this is a really good, I think I, think I see where you're going with this. Um, <laughs> we, we all have this incredible inheritance right now that over the last, you know, somewhere between, you know, depending on how you count, 10 and 50 years, there's been hundreds of really, hundreds of million, but billions of dollars that have gone into a variety of services and products and software and infrastructure. And all of that is basically now something that we that we build on. So for example, um, at, well, I've said in the book that I was reflecting as I was doing the share economy and where we're really moving, my phrase was, we're moving from an economy and a lifestyle where access trumps ownership. What I realized is that I probably could do a photo and get to the same place with 10% of the money we raised. And the reason is um, hosting services, uh, you know, cloud services, obviously, even the physical infrastructure, you know, with personal publishing and all these sorts of things has come so far along. Pick and pack, you know, all of this is, is available by the drink or, you know, in, a, in an SAS model or ASP, however you know, people refer to it. But fundamentally, it's everything has changed. And the other part, I think, you know, also is that there's this ability to make cocktails between a variety of other services, like uh, social, you know, social media. Um, with Ophoto, we were really the first uh, people to take a digital product and begin to start to play with how what, what would be the implication when you mix in somebody's friends and family, and the implication was really terrific, obviously. So um, most of the entrepreneurs here um, launching companies now uh, are probably familiar with this idea, okay, we've got to, we've got to scrap and okay, we get Gmail for our Gmail uh, service uh, or email email service at the beginning because it's free and then as you say, use use Amazon for cloud services, just just lowest cost and put together a, a, a cocktail of, of, you know, by the drink as you mentioned. So um, just talk about your, your book and, and what that means for entrepreneurs, the mesh. Can you tell us what you mean by the mesh what are the new businesses that are being that are being created on that basis? Absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not an author. My, my uh, disclaimer is, you know, I, I'm not an author by tra by training. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. What got me to write the book was essentially that I was like amazed by how many companies I were, was running into, and so I started to make myself a you know a database that turned into a directory that's now uh, the the Mesh directory, which is at meshing it, meshing.it. But I launched it about a month ago, and it's already doubled in size, and there's 30 plus categories. And so companies as big as um, Netflix and Zipcar and Amazon Web Services are all Mesh companies, and I'll explain more. And then there's really small um, startups that, that go from pop-up grocery stores to uh, things like Relay Rides and, and Whipcar and uh, Kiss Kiss Bank Bank or Kickstarter. All of these things, it's a peer-to-peer -peer phenomenon. So what I'm calling the mesh is essentially, and for many of us in this room, uh, you know, we have been so immersed in this technology. Groupon, Andrew was just here, and, and Jack was here yesterday talking about Twitter. Those are really important pieces, again, of our inheritance when we start to look at the mesh. Because um, the web is getting physical. We're getting up out of our chairs and going out into our towns and starting to make mischief with our neighbors and do interesting things. Mm -hmm. I think that the recession also helped a lot of these businesses get started. But um, pick, a, pick a domain, you know, energy, fashion, uh, rent the runway, um, bag, bar, steel, uh, you know, on and on. Um, you could enter in energy and in food and finance and 
uh, all the peer-to-peer -peer lending guys. And it's not just Prosper in the Lending Club, but uh, there's things like Smarty Pig and Big Carrots, and you know they have funny names and everything too. Um, and you, know, you mentioned the pop up grocery store. So you know, I, I, we were talking about Chez Panisse, this great restaurant in, on, in the East Bay. Yes. I ha had, a, had a lot of trouble just staying open because the cost of putting together just an amazing food for food lovers. So deciding to actually not necessarily totally close down, but launch the pop up grocery store at a specific time, right, in a, in a very cheap place where these food lovers can congregate at a much cheaper price, right? So th there's all these sorts of business models happening, right? With, with, with these stream in time, using the web to, to mobilize people. How can these, these, these entrepreneurs uh, and future entrepreneurs who are thinking about their ideas Absolutely. take advantage of this and um, use it for maybe marketing or, or brand creation? What are the things that you so would recommend? Two, thank you for that. I, um, there's two things. One is, I think, Talking about the pop, does everybody here, have you ever heard of pop-up grocery stores or pop-up fashion stores or any of these sorts of things? If you've heard of it, can you raise your hand just so I can see? So essentially it's the phenomenon like the creme brulee truck in San Francisco or the kimchi quesadilla truck and all of these sorts of things. They're made possible by um, things like Twitter where you can, you have a, a, a thing that's a movable feast, literally and you're moving the truck around, uh, people aren't coming to you at the same location and they don't know what you have that day, but you're able to let people know where you are and what you have and how many, you, excuse me, you have left on the basis of these, these tools that we have. So we're all, most of us walking around with this mobile, you know, web-enabled mobile device that also has GPS. And so we're able to move towards what IBM years ago called the Internet of Things, which is essentially making um, the, the web very physical. So go back to your question, you know, pop-up stores are possible because we look around in many of the cities and towns we live in, there's empty real estate. Um, these people basically said, hey, we love the restaurant business. What we really want to do is um, get out of the restaurant business because we're losing our shirts. But um, we know all these really cool people who are foodies. And there's, on both sides, there's foodies who are our friends that want to buy stuff and eat, and there's foodies who are our friends that are making and growing awesome things. So in Oakland, they, they're, they have been doing for probably a year or so, this pop-up grocery store, and essentially it happens every few weeks. They let people know where it's gonna be, you kind of pre-order, it's very exciting. It went from being like 30 people coming out to hundreds of people coming out, it's a big event. And this has been going on at, at uh, Gatwick, there's a, a store that just opened up, that's a pop-up store, they have a slightly different strategy, but again, it's all of this tying um, smaller brands and perishable time of people's hours. You're walking past some store in Gatwick Airport or you are trying to figure out what to buy when you go to visit uh, or live in Oakland. The, the perishability factor is really important because a lot, when we look at small businesses, Andrew Mason was just talking here, um, about that, that small businesses are really trying to get the inventory that they have to the right person. It's, it's, it's a kind of microcasting. And our ability to, to do that with the tools that we have is, I just want you to make, my strong opinion is, we're in the very, very, very beginning of that. That tools like um, Twitter and Groupon, these are first generations of the cocktail between social, mobile, and web. And, and I think that that's just really, really important. So, you know, ta tactics are things that I call like, um, which I pinched from a firm in the UK, uh, trend watching. They call it tribertizing, and it's a way to essentially take a product. So if you have a product that you want to test in a market, you use the various tools that we all have, Twitter and, uh, and Facebook and other you know, social systems, uh, and begin to like, for example, I sat here for a few minutes, and Pixie, um, the, the homing cloud, Bump, and Needly are all mesh businesses. They're all, they're all out there trying hard to begin to, to hone their offer to that particular market. And they're making this kind of mashup between the social phenomenon, the particular uh, real estate offering, or you know, what's happening in, in a very uh, micro way in a particular town. Uh, so, so, so if you're, if you're, you're